What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. How Aurelian restored the Roman Empire, part one. Let's go. Amidst the rugged mountains on the dry, arid stretch of the Syrian steppe lay a wealthy city in a lush, fertile oasis. Adorned with sumptuous colonnaded streets, tetrapylons, majestic temples, spacious agoras, theatres and baths, elaborate stone reliefs, monumental Valley of the Tombs and administrative government buildings, the city of Palmyra was the jewel of the Middle East and a melting pot at the crossroads of culture, with Roman, Greek, Aramean, Arabian, and Persian influences all okay. on display. Ooh, very interesting. For over 30 years, this was the place that Queen Zenobia called home, where she wove together the obligations of kinship, patronage, and civic solidarity that Palmyra demanded of its notables. Um, but in the scorching sun interesting i don't know anything about her it'd be interesting to find out a bit more about her if she yeah let me know let me know a bit more or maybe a video about her or anything like that light of the late summer of 272 a.d the queen stood on the steps of the temple of baal with a troubled brow her troops posted on the outskirts of the city okay she firmly grasped her cloak in her hand as the smoke and fragrance of lingering incense filled the air and the sounds of solemn hymns sung to flutes, drums and tambourines reverberated in the majestic hall. Mm. With a camel at her side, carrying a shrine in which a sacred stone was shrouded, Zenobia intoned prayers and made offerings of oil and wine, asking her god Baal for protection against those she perceived to be the invaders of her empire. Okay. However, the Emperor Aurelian deemed Zenobia's authority to be Aurelian. I'll try and pronounce that correctly. Illegitimate, and her bid for power unsanctioned, and he came to Palmyra at the head of an army to settle the matter once and for all. Hmm. The I'll be the judge. I'll be the judge. Located in the semi-desert steppe of eastern Syria, Palmyra was a powerful city on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. It derived the majority of its wealth from its location on the caravan trade routes of the Middle East. The city's merchants were renowned for their ability to secure safe passage of goods through treacherous country from one water source to another, especially during the dry season. Palmarine traders operated throughout the empire and, more crucially, played a major role in connecting Roman Syria to the Middle Euphrates and from there the Persian Gulf. Right, that makes sense. Okay. okay. Since the times of Emperor Caracalla, Palmyra enjoyed the status of a colonia. However, in the middle decades of the 3rd century AD, when the Sassanids fought Rome for control of Armenia and Upper Mesopotamia, Palmyra attained a heightened political and strategic significance under the leadership of a prominent local aristocrat, Septimius Odonathus. The instability of warfare in the region threatened Palmyrene trade, and Rome expected the Palmarines to provide for their own security. This inadvertently... Oh, they had to provide for their own security. They had to provide for their own security, really? ...helped the city to create a martial tradition of its own, and in the 240s and 250s, Odonathus used the reputation he had built up through his successful protection of the caravan routes from raiders Let's get and the power his for position himself, as right? commander of Palmyra's cavalry and dromedary archers to secure his dominance mm -hmm. over the city and its civic council. 
By 251 AD, he and his eldest son, Herodian Hiron, were being honored in Palmyra as Resh, or leader, an unprecedented title among the Palmyrene elite. The two continued to amass power, claiming consular rank by 258, and in 259, mm. Odonathus campaigned against the Persians, sacking the city of Nihardia on the Euphrates. Odonathus's greatest opportunity then came in spring 260, when Emperor Valerian was captured by the Persians at the Battle of Edessa. Oh. Valerian's son Gallienus was left as sole ruler of Rome, but the disaster of an emperor falling captive in battle sparked a crisis of loyalties. A oh. cascade of usurpers oh. sprung up across the empire. In the unstable frontier regions, ambitious men seized power, usually elected by the troops or the local aristocracy, greatly contributing to the erosion of imperial authority mm. and the decline of its internal structures. The populace suffered against incursions that were becoming increasingly difficult to check, most notably an Alemannic invasion of Italy that had already begun even before Valerian's capture and which Gallienus eventually crushed outside Milan. At Mate, it's just so much to deal with though. As well as Herulian and Gothic raids that saw the sacking of numerous cities in Greece, Macedonia, Thrace and Asia Minor, including Byzantium. Yeah, this this was a real chaotic point for the um for the Roman Empire, this third century. Argos, Corinth, Sparta, Olympia, and Athens as well as the destruction of one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis oh. at Ephesus. It's a shame so many things have been destroyed for the earth for us not to be able to experience it. In the West, General Posthumus, his Rhine army, and the governors loyal to him broke away from central authority, forging a Romano-Gallic regime with Posthumus as emperor, oh. further rocking an empire. I didn't know that. Empire seemingly on the brink of disintegration. It's just like having three Roman empires at this point in time. Integration. The Roman East was just as turbulent. Macrianus, one of the main fiscal officers of the empire, grabbed the opportunity. Oh. Only two, sorry. I thought this was called the Byzantine Empire at this point. Using well, his influence as Valerian's treasurer to march on Rome. Planning to seize the capital, he took with him his eldest son, Macrianus Minor, intending to elevate him to the throne in the west. See. He left his younger son, Quietus, in charge of the eastern provinces, supported by the Praetorian prefect, Ballista, who was instrumental in propping up Macrianus's sons to the imperial throne. The momentum to usurp the throne gathered behind Macrianus, but his army was intercepted and defeated in Thrace, with both he and his eldest son killed in the encounter. Okay. Meanwhile, Quietus and Ballista lost control over the eastern provinces. In a calculated show of loyalty to Emperor Gallienus, Odonathus marched on Emesa and overthrew what remained of the usurper regime. Oh, so he was... So he actually helped Rome at this point. He hasn't broken off from, from them yet. Ever move. Gallienus to do it. recognized Odonathus's de facto authority, mm. who was subsequently honored as restorer of all the East, essentially becoming the viceroy of Rome's most eastern provinces. This gave him authority over Roman governors and military forces in Syria and Upper Mesopotamia. He knew what he was which doing. Which Odonathus used to great effect to help push the Persians out of the eastern provinces, okay. recapturing Roman fortresses of Carhai and Nisibis. In a brazen move showing his ambitions, he had declared himself King of Kings, a challenge to the imperial claims of Shahpur I of Persia. 
<laughs> Lol, you're joking, right? Oh, my man. Why do people just get a little bit more power and like, that's it. Like, I am now king. Like, 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 like chill for a little bit, please. You got a tiny, a tiny, tiny portion of the Roman Empire. Like, like, secure yourself more power before you start taking that title. Like, surely, king is, king brings so many dangers. Put, making yourself a king is probably one of the stupidest things you could do unless you have such security behind you. In 262 and 266, he twice invaded Persian-held Lower Mesopotamia, reaching as far as the Persian capital Ctesiphon on both occasions, mm. but was unable to take the city. In 267, on the Emperor's orders, he also campaigned against Gothic and Herulian raiders. It, by now, Odonathus had reached the apex of his power. However, members of Gallienus's court and Palmyra's elite were viewing his and his family's growing ambition with increasing concern. Okay. Although the details vary between the sources, it appears that in 267 or 268, Odonathus and his son Herodian were assassinated in a joint Gallienic Palmyrene conspiracy. The plan. See? Don't say you're a king. Backfired. Far from destroying the power of his dynasty, his widow Septimia Zenobia took matters into her own hands. See, she's gonna have to deal with the fallout of you naming yourself a king. Stupid. 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 See? See? See what I mean? The other senators thought you got too much power because you were starting to, to just... Yeah. Stupid. She propped up her young son Vabalathus as the new restorer of the entire East, thereby treating her husband's viceroy position as hereditary, with herself taking the title of queen and ruling as regent. Queen's the same thing as king. She wisely chose not to break ties with the imperial court, as she was not yet ready for war, but no one was left in doubt in the East. Gallienus did not accept that Odonathus's position as viceroy, which he himself granted in the first place, could be passed on to Zenobia's son. However, the establishment of Palmyra in the east, coupled with the failure to defeat the Gallic Empire in the west, seriously weakened Gallienus. Ah, I see. The stability of the Roman Empire deteriorated further still when he too was assassinated in September 268. Oh, assassinations left, right, and goddamn center. Different accounts of the incident are recorded, but they agree that senior officials wanted Gallienus dead. The new emperor Claudius managed to bring some stability. He stopped the Alemannic invasion of Raetia and Italy at Lake Benicus. He then marched east to meet a major Gothic invasion in the Balkans. Okay. At the Battle of Nisus, he achieved a major victory over the barbarians. Okay, nice. However, the continuation of the war was less conclusive due to the outbreak of the plague, which uh, affected the Romans, but savaged the Goths even The crisis of the third century, eh? Even worse. Many Goths who survived were either admitted into the Roman legions or had lands assigned for them to cultivate. Preoccupied with matters in the Balkans, Claudius sent an expedition against Zenobia under Heraclianus, a former Praetorian prefect, to reassert control over the east. Okay. The details are unknown, but the campaign was a disastrous failure for the central government. This was oh, the point really? of- Oh, really? Really? Like, it was just a massive fail? Unfortunate no return. Recognizing weakness in the Empire's central authority, in the spring of 270, Zenobia sent an expedition of her own to conquer the Roman province of Arabia. 
This campaign, commanded by her general Zabdas, mm -hmm. defeated the Cyrenian Third Legion, killed its commander, and subdued its troops. Okay. Later that summer, the queen launched an invasion of Egypt with an army consisting of Palmarines, Syrian legionnaires, mercenaries, and barbarians. It was a grueling, hard-fought campaign, but Zenobia's forces successfully took Egypt. They're really, really pushing their limits. Do they really, do they really think that they're going to be able to pull this off? They really think that's possible? Wow, I guess the West is in such turmoil. The plague has just hit. It is the crisis of the third century. Great time to be alive. <laughs> Despite the setback in the East, in the Empire's West, the Gallic Empire was similarly unstable. Mm -hmm. And the assassination of Posthumus in 269 had pro oh, I love this series already. Three assassinations in the first episode, and what, we're in 14 minutes in? Yes. Series of defections. <laughs> Claudius's trusted general Placidianus seized the moment and took control of southern Gaul after several victories. Mm -hmm. Hispania followed suit, breaking their allegiance to the new Gallic Emperor Victorinus and declared their loyalty to Claudius. But the Emperor would not live long enough to reunite the lost territories. In the summer of 270, he journeyed to Sirmia. Out of all the Emperors, he just looks like a typical guy from an English pub, don't he? I don't know why, but Claudius just looks like your typical geezer down at a UK pub. Where he prepared for a campaign against the Vandals who were raiding Pannonia. On the way, he fell victim to a pestilence, likely the plague of Cyprian, mm. a form of smallpox, and he died in August 270. Oh, shit. His younger brother, Quintilius, currently stationed at Aquileia, was declared emperor by the Senate. But, in an act typical of the crisis of the third century, the new emperor was not recognized by the legions that served under Claudius, who instead threw their support behind his right-hand man, the talented Illyrian cavalry general, Lucius oh, okay. Demetius Aurelianus, more commonly mm. known as Aurelian. Okay. Let's see what he does, considering that he wasn't... He wasn't the uh, intended emperor at the time. I'll be interested to see uh, what happens. It looked like more war and turmoil would engulf what remained of the Roman Empire. But the reign of Quintilius proved extraordinarily brief, possibly lasting as few as 17 days. He committed suicide, realizing he had little hope against the army of Aurelian. Holy, holy. This is why you just don't want to be any kind of leader. Your, your position is just so fragile. If you don't have full support, you don't know what's going to happen in the night or around the next corner. So scary, so unstable. The Senate now recognized Aurelian as the new emperor, but he inherited a state in a dismal condition that had been disintegrating for the past 20 years. Vast territories remained outside of central imperial control, some for nearly a generation. Okay. Internal turmoil encouraged pressure from external enemies, and renewed incursions by the tribes north of the Danube spread devastation deep into the interior. And mm. with yet another emperor seizing power, the threat of civil wars again grew as new usurpers arose exploiting the imperial insecurities and the influence of armies on Roman politics. Which is understandable considering he wasn't chosen by the Senate. Um, so I'm really interested to see where this goes. The spiraling political and economic crisis impacted agriculture and commerce the most, which was compounded by the pestilence that had first swept through the empire around the year 250 
greatly diminishing manpower for the armies and taxation. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the new emperor steeled himself for the difficult road ahead. He's a brave man. In the east, seeking to strengthen the image and power of her regime, Queen Zenobia skillfully played the political game. She exploited the turmoil in Rome, but was careful not to provoke a war with the new emperor. Her mints at Antioch and Alexandria recognized Aurelian as emperor, producing coins in his name. Okay. But she also now struck coins bearing the face of her son, Vabalathus, honoring him as imperator, a military title of republican origins that was now associated with emperors. Hmm. See what I mean? She is super ambitious. She is super ambitious. What are you doing? You're killing yourself and your family. Your poor boy has got to deal with your consequences here. Oh my God. Stupid. Crazy. Uh, yeah, also like, yeah, I... I I saw your comment and I, I think you're like, yeah, I thought about it more. Obviously, at this point in time, um, there was emperors. So, obviously, the Senate had no chance. Absolutely no chance. I see the army had all the power. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Who, who's, who can, can take... Uh, who can take over by by authority and power? That was that was the big, the best way to do it. Now, wasn't it? That's how you become emperor. In this way, Zenobia gave him imperial status, whilst cleverly avoiding the title of Augustus, which would have unambiguously designated him as emperor, blatantly challenging Aurelian's authority. Roman mints were spread widely across the empire and emperors used them to make political statements to their subjects. Okay. The populace often learned of a new Roman emperor when coins appeared with his portrait. Thus, the circulation of coins bearing Vabalathus's face undoubtedly solidified his authority over the Palmyrene domain, but it was also an encroachment on Aurelian's authority. See what I mean? She's just, she's overstepping all these little boundaries so, so much. Zenobia's power play extended further. Her coins bore inscriptions that recorded the number of years that Vabalathus had ruled the East, thereby showing that he had been in power longer than the Emperor, as if to suggest her son's seniority over Aurelian. Coupled with this web of political intrigue, Zenobia began the expansion of her army and moved into Asia Minor. Okay. She captured Tiana. She's, she's going into Asia Minor as well. In Cappadocia and Ancyra in Galatia and attempted to seize Chalcedon in Bithynia, which resisted and remained loyal to Aurelian. With this show of force, the Queen wanted to hinder any offensive by the Emperor, while she also played the long game, slowly building up the power of her realm. But despite the Palmyrene expansion further hindering the Empire's reunification, the Gothic problem in the Balkans remained unresolved, and Aurelian's own position was far from stable. Yeah, it's not the looking first stable order at all. of business for the Emperor was to strengthen his rule in the territories that were still under central control. Aurelian was an exceptional leader of armies, and he campaigned with unmatched energy. Okay. In 270, he stopped a Yetunjian invasion of northern Italy, fighting a series of actions before defeating them in a decisive battle on the Danube. Mm. He caught them in the middle of crossing the river, weighed down with plunder and prisoners. However, while he was consolidating his power in Italy, the Pannonian frontier was left vulnerable to attack, and an army of vandals crossed the river in force, pillaging the region. Later that year, he tasked Placidianus with defending Italy against a possible attack by the Gallic Empire, mm -hmm. before departing east to set up his headquarters in Siscia. 
It was here that he assumed his consulship on New Year's Day, 271 AD. Okay. This office would normally have been assumed at Rome, and it was unusual for an emperor to assume the consulship without even setting foot in the old capital. This was a further sign of the diminishing role of Rome in imperial pomp at this time. It was just a big old diminishing situation for Rome, wasn't it? Absolutely. By now, the season had advanced, making it difficult for the Vandals to live off the land, and knowing that the enemy was not equipped for siege warfare, Aurelian evacuated the livestock and food supplies into the fortified cities. Once he was satisfied that the war of attrition had weakened the barbarians and that his own supply lines were established, he marched to meet the Vandals. The campaign was a grueling affair, but after an indecisive first battle, the barbarians were subsequently defeated in the Pannonian interior. Mm. The Vandals sued for peace, handing over hostages and providing 2,000 horsemen for the Roman army, and the Romans provided them with supplies for their journey back to the Danube. Okay. The Emperor, however, had little respite in which to savour his victory, and in early mm. 271, he was forced to march back west. The Itungi had returned, this time probably with a coalition of other... He really did just have to deal with everything all at once. ...the Germanic tribes, launching a major invasion of Italy. They destroyed numerous towns and countryside in the Po Valley before pushing south, threatening Rome itself. At first, Aurelian's army suffered an ambush at Placentia, but he managed to regroup his battered army right. and follow the trail of devastation that marked the enemy's route down the Adriatic coast. My god, they are really carving into Rome at the moment. Knowing that the Romans were on their heels, the barbarians stayed on the march, aiming to cross the Apennines towards the capital. But Aurelian managed to catch up with them. On the banks of the Matoris River, he achieved a major victory in the Battle of Fano. Right. Subsequently, he pushed the invaders back across the Po River before dealing a crushing defeat to the Irtungi in the Battle of Ticinum. Mm. The victory broke the strength of the tribes along the upper Danube and put an end to Germanic invasions against Italy until the times of Alaric in the 400s, nearly 150 years later. Okay, very interesting. Meanwhile, the invasion caused panic in Rome itself, and this, combined with the endemic corruption, had sparked a major rebellion against the emperor. Aurelian force marched his army to Wow once again another rebellion another thing I'm gonna put this down I'm gonna deal with this this problem happens I'm gonna deal with this oh this and this happens like this poor man has to put out every single fire and then some fuck's sake Pink. the capital defeated the rebels and executed the conspirators using the crisis to purge the political landscape of his rivals mm -hmm. as well many of whom had supported Quintilius. I think at this point you just have to do what you have to do as Aurelian. Usurpers in Dalmatia and southern Gaul, seeking to exploit the chaos, were either defeated in battle or assassinated, and construction began on a massive new system of walls to better protect the capital. Okay. But again, Aurelian had no time to waste. After briefly overseeing work on the new defences, the Emperor marched back east to the Balkans. Due to his elevation to the purple and the resulting mm -hmm. power struggle in Rome, the Gothic War remained unfinished business. And now the ranks of marauding bands had swelled, posing a great menace to Thrace. They were led by King Canabas. This goth was possible. I recognize his name. None other than King Caniva, who had famously destroyed the army of the Emperor Decius at the Battle of Abratus mm. 20 years prior, an event etched in the memory of the Romans. 
By the time Aurelian arrived with his army, the Goths had already inflicted considerable damage. But in a stunning twist, the Roman Emperor inflicted on them a crushing <clears throat> defeat. Nice. However, unlike his predecessors, he did not stop there. Oh, yes. Rather, crossing the Danube, he invaded their homeland and scored a decisive victory over King Canabas, who mm. was killed in combat. The Roman army then. It's like that uh, end again scene where end, uh, end, like Ender's asked. Uh, why didn't you stop after I kicked uh, after you kicked into the floor and you just stood because I needed to win I won the battle but I wanted to win the war I wanted to basically inflict so much pain on them that they never come into my land again I ain't never going to be doing that yeah Aurelian is is slowly starting to live up to your expectation like so uh, I'm I'm liking it proceeded to sack gothic settlements and lay waste to their lands. Mm. And in a planned propaganda move, countless captive women were deported to Rome to be later displayed dressed as Amazons in Aurelian's triumph. That's interesting. This was the most decisive victory a Roman army had in this region throughout the troubled third century. Oh, okay, yeah, that's going to be big as well then. Then, in a radical rethinking of regional strategy, the Emperor withdrew Rome's military and administrative presence from Dacia. The province had been weakly garrisoned since the reign of Gallienus. Mm -hmm. By abandoning it altogether, Aurelian could rationalize the long and undermanned Danubian frontier from which he collected troops and repopulate the Balkans, okay, devastated very by war with the people he evacuated from Dacia. Not just very strong, it's very smart as well. It's a very good decision. Now, he was ready to retake the East. Mm. Credit goes to our awesome... I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Let's look at some of these footnotes. Look at the assassination. Oh, really? 